kids get bored. It's just part of growing up. Or at least, that's what their parents would always say. Living in a small town in England, you run out of things to do by your fifth birthday. By your tenth, you want nothing more than to move out. By your fifteenth, half the kids end up in hospital doing something stupid. The kid entering the churchyard tonight is no exception. As he ducks under the gap in the chain link fence, he catches the corner of his cast on the metal. The cast is already so covered in nicks and scratches that the new tear barely makes a difference. He has been trying to cut the cast off with kitchen scissors for the last three weeks. He'd broken his wrist riding his bike off the roof of his house. It would have worked if it wasn't for the post box being a little too close to the building. His brother calls out to him from up ahead. He's already at the door to the church. The kid hears his best friend shuffling around nervously behind him. He waits for her turn to duck under the fence and follow him into the churchyard away from the road. Even in the middle of nowhere, in total darkness, the kid can tell she's scared to break the rules. The pair of them rush over to meet the kid's brother at the entrance to the church. The older brother grins at both of them. At 21 years old, he may- Hell yeah, dude, I'm gonna get one of those, I'm gonna get a neck tattoo. Who asked? Shut the fuck up! Maybe I just wanted to tell you guys. May as well be 41. Towering over the two of them, with a few scraggly chin hairs and a tattoo on his neck. Hell yeah. They can't imagine what his life must be like. Going to university in London, driving a car, getting tattoos, drinking alcohol that costs more than 10 quid and doesn't come from the corner store. 10 what? Tattoos, drinking alcohol that costs more than 10 quid and doesn't- The fuck is that? What the fuck is a quid? You can pay in quids? What the fuck is a quid? 10 pounds. Nah, that's not- yeah, 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 see, that's like fake money, dude. Is that like Monopoly money? Come from the corner store? What a life. There isn't a door to kick open. The church building is in total disrepair. Only the limestone structure is left standing. The windows have all been smashed in long ago, and the pews rotted away, leaving only some moss creeping its tendrils into every nook and cranny. As the three of them make their way inside, they look up to see the starry night sky above their heads, no roof left intact. In fact, the only part of the building that seems to still be half standing is the tower at the far end. Even in the dark, they can still make out a tight spiral staircase hewn into the stone, disappearing up Ooh. into the collapsing tower. The kid grins. What to explore first? They all split up, wandering around different parts of the church hall. The kid makes a beeline for a toppled-in patch of wall. He clambers up onto a window ledge and hoists himself up onto the wall, looking down at the other two. A stone gives way under his foot and almost sends him tumbling, but he throws out his broken wrist just in time to balance himself. Across the hall, his best friend is checking her flip phone anxiously. She'd said earlier in the evening that she needed to be back before 1 a.m. or her parents would be worried. It's already 12.45. The kid's older brother calls out across the church. I need the toilet. I'm gonna climb straight to the top of the tower and do it off the edge. Watch out for rain. <laughs> and with that, he disappears through the little doorway and up Hell the spiral yeah. staircases. Very quickly, the sound of his footsteps disappears, leaving the kid and his friend alone together. The kid looks over his shoulder out of the church building. From up on this patch of wall, he is almost at the perfect height to pick an apple from the tree next to them. If he can just stretch out far enough... There, he plucks two apples, one for him and one for his friend. He tosses it to her, but she misses the catch. Looking up at him, he can tell she already wants to go home. He grumbles and jumps down from the wall. The landing jars his leg pretty badly, but he clenches his teeth hard enough that no noise escapes his mouth. He grins yeah, at his best up. friend. She doesn't return it. It's late. Oh. She needs to get home soon. Oh. And the only way they can get home is in his big brother's Friend car. Zone. Fine, I guess it's probably home time. She gives him her best attempt at a smile. The kid walks over to the stairs, sticks his head through the doorway, and calls out. No response. Great. How high do these stairs go? They can't be more than a couple of stories, surely. He calls again. Still nothing. His best friend appears at his shoulder. They both peer up the staircase. It's such a tight spiral that they can't really see anything beyond the first ten steps. It's dark in there, almost too dark to see where they're going. Hello. He gets out his flashlight and flicks it on. Hello. That should be enough light for the both of them. The kid plants his foot on the first step and starts climbing. The steps feel well worn. They're smooth in the middle and dip down slightly from years of use. One step, two steps, three, four, five. His flashlight dies. He shakes it, knocking the back of it a couple of times like they do in the movies. Nothing. Not even a flicker. He asks his friend if she has a flashlight. She doesn't. So She's the two of them climb in the dark. 
very quickly, the stairs change shape. Or maybe that's the wrong word. They aren't changing shape, they're just shrinking. It's subtle, but definitely happening. The gaps between them are getting smaller, and the undersides of the stairs above are bearing down on the kid's head slightly. The kid stops and turns to his best friend. He can hardly see her at all in the dark. She's just a slightly darker shadow standing a couple of steps down from him. He asks if the steps are getting smaller. She tells him not that she can tell. He insists they must be. The stairs above their heads are getting lower and lower. The space is closing in on them slightly. She says she has no idea what he's talking about. Tutting at her, he takes a couple more steps up the staircase. The cast on his arm tightens. That's strange. He keeps going and, all of a sudden, it feels like a vice. The blood flow is cut off almost instantaneously. His fingers feel cold and start to tingle, his forearm swelling and bulging around the edge of the cast. The pressure building up inside it is ridiculous, feels almost as if the cast splits apart and falls off. Blood rushes back to his fingertips. He flexes them gratefully, turning to his best friend. Even in the darkness, he can tell she's peering at him intently. He runs a hand over his arm, massaging it gently. That's strange. His arm feels different from how it did before it went into the cast. There's more hair on it now, and the muscle running along his forearm feels more pronounced. He flexes his wrist. No pain, no stiffness, nothing. He isn't due to get his cast off for another month at least. Those doctors clearly don't know what they're talking about. Are you standing on your tiptoes? His friend asks from behind him. He looks down at her shadow, confused, and tells her no, he isn't. The kid apparently looks taller. Must just be uneven stairs, or a trick of the light. Come to think of it, though, his best friend does look a little different standing there below him, <laughs> even just from her silhouette. She isn't any taller, but her figure looks different. Her voice sounds a little lower. His brother, that's who they're after. They'd get to the top of the stairs, find him, and see what was going on. Must just be some strange optical illusions happening here in the dark. The two of them press on, continuing up the stairs. Step after step, they go. They must be up on the second floor by now, surely. But there's no light ahead of them indicating any kind of exit, just more stairs. The kid asks his friend what time it is. He hears her flipping open her phone and pressing a couple of buttons, but no light fills the space. She presses them again and again. Nothing. Her battery must have died. That's the only explanation. She tries to tell him that it was almost on full a minute ago, but he doesn't really listen because at that moment, he sticks a hand in his pocket to take out the apple he'd plucked. Warm goop sticks to his fingers. His Ugh. back pocket is full of sticky mush. Little creatures wriggle around inside it. Ugh. Maggots. How had he plucked a rotten apple? It felt fine on the branch. He takes another step, hands still absently hovering over his pocket. A buzzing sound. A couple of flies brush past his fingers. What had they been doing in his pocket? He hears them drift around him and up the staircase, until suddenly, their buzzing stops. He crouches down and squints hard in the dark. He can just about make out two little flies lying on the stair just two steps away from him, both on their backs, legs curled. The kid reaches back into his pocket and feels around. The sticky mush is gone. Just some kind of dry, dusty substance is left. Strangely, the kid doesn't panic. He knows somewhere in his head that everything hey, happening Karen, to him is very peculiar, yet he doesn't feel worried about it at all. To be honest, all he really cares about right now is making it to the top of this staircase. He takes off, running two steps at a time up towards where his brother must be waiting. Part of his mind notices that the jarring feeling in his leg from jumping off the wall is gone. No time to think about that now. Up he runs, each stride throwing him further and further. Somewhere behind him, he can hear his best friend muttering something to herself, something incoherent and garbled. Her voice definitely sounds different now. It barely sounds like her anymore. She sounds more like more like her mother. The kid catches his foot on a step and falls. His best friend clatters into the back of him before she has a chance to stop. The two of them topple over, landing awkwardly on a step, enough to knock the wind out of him. She lies on top of him. Only, it can't be her. It feels like a fully grown woman, not his 15-year-old friend. She whispers to him. Her voice doesn't sound scared at all, though. If anything, she seems a little disinterested. What's happening to us? The kid breathes heavily, struggling to get the air back into his lungs. That's when he notices the smell. Something deathly rotten is filling the oh, staircase. Oh, his friend died! Something moldy his and decaying. Brother. She seems to notice it too. The pair of them stand up straight and peer up the stairs. In the gloom, they can see it clearly enough. A person slumped oh. on the ground. The smell tells them all they need to know about this person. 
They should run, right now. They should run back down the staircase and out of there. Yet both of them inexplicably and in unison continue walking up the stairs, closing the gap on the corpse. It blocks off two whole steps, lying awkwardly on its side, slightly hunched over as if the person had collapsed in a coughing fit. The kid almost slips over. Something small is under his foot, something metallic. He reaches down and picks it up, feeling its shape and knowing almost immediately what it is. He lifts the lid and flicks the red and gold lighter on. A little flame fills the staircase with light, orange and weak, dancing around the stone. It is just enough to make out the flecks of blood coughed out of the corpse's mouth and onto the stone steps. It is just enough to see the scruffy little beard sprouting out of the corpse's face. It's just enough to make out the tattoo on the corpse's neck. The kid looks down at his older brother. Not just his older brother, but his older brother. Whereas before he had seemed like he was 41, he now looks like it. 41 and dead from something in his lungs. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The kid whoa. turns okay. to see All right. his best Okay, friend. well, hold on, hold on, hold on. When, when is 41 old and dead? Okay, what the heck? What the heck, man? When's 41 old and dead? Man, that's messed up. Still younger than you! Ha 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 ha! A woman in her mid-30s looks back at him. Her hair even has a couple of telltale grays. She should look afraid, but her expression is almost blank. But there's a little something there, just enough of an expression to tell him that she's seeing the same transformation on his face looking back at her. The kid reaches up to touch his cheek. Oh, a wiry yeah. beard meets his fingertips. Hell yeah, they brother. should run. They should run back down these stairs and get out of here. Call an ambulance and go home. And yet, the kid flicks the lighter closed, turns around, and steps over his older brother's body. As he walks up the stairs in silence, he hears his best friend doing the same. The after fuck? five more stairs, his knee starts to give out. Then his hip soon after that. It gets harder and harder to stand up straight, so he lets himself stoop slightly. His best friend's breathing grows softer and wispier behind him. The pace slows down. Each step seems to take more out of him, feeling harder than the last. He needs a rest. That's all he needs. If he can just sit down for a second. His chest clamps in on itself like a vice. Blood hammers in his ears. Sweat floods across his brow in an instant and the whole world seems to tilt around him. The kid collapses on the ground, feeling his brittle wrist snapping under him. Pain shoots through his body as his chest squeezes tighter and tighter. He rolls onto his back, gasping for air with frail lungs. The kid claws at his sunken ribcage, feeling loose wrinkled skin under his fingertips. With a monumental effort, he flicks the lighter on to see an old woman peering at him through the dark. He can hardly recognize his best friend anymore as she gently takes the lighter from his hand and steps over his convulsing body. He watches helplessly as she continues gingerly up the stairs in silence. She doesn't look back over Holy her shoulder, fuck. disappearing around the corner, taking the light with her, leaving the kid to die an old man in total darkness. With one final gasp of air before his heart gives out on him, he clings desperately to one hope. She's going to make it to the top of the stairs. She has to. It is fortunate in many ways that SCP-723 is in such a remote area. While the church has stood on that site for hundreds of years, for much of that time it has been abandoned. Little is known about the history of the church as many of the events around it have descended into local folklore. What is known about SCP-723 is that it is a spiral staircase housed within an abandoned church building in an undisclosed location in rural England. For all intents and purposes, it is an unremarkable set of stairs. Made from ordinary limestone from the local quarry, the steps are approximately 0.75 meters wide and worn away in the middle, apparently from frequent use. If you were to look at the outside of the church, you would see that the tower containing the staircase is not particularly tall and is in a state of disrepair. Taking a look inside that tower, however, seems to show the staircase extending up beyond the height of the tower, something that seems on the surface to be physically impossible. In fact, how high the staircase itself goes is a mystery to this day, as those studying SCP-723 are yet to find a way to see inside it beyond the first two floors. This is because every object, living or otherwise, that ascends up SCP-723 undergoes a rapid aging process. Organic creatures quickly grow older, die, and decompose on their way up the steps. Other objects behave as if a great deal of time has passed. Batteries and electronic devices go flat almost immediately. Decay is accelerated too, meaning wear and tear take place at an alarmingly fast rate. This renders any conventional methods of exploring SCP-723 obsolete. Sound and video recording equipment running on battery power quickly fail. 
After many attempts with different technology, recording devices linked to a robust cable were created specifically for trying to record footage beyond the first story of SCP-723. However, the video recordings failed around the second story, and sound recordings failed around the fourth. Living subjects were required to transport these devices up the staircase, and so D-Class personnel were tasked with the job. Across all documented experiments, none of the subjects returned. Holy In each case, shit. a subtle change was noticed in the subjects upon crossing the fifth step. One subject paused, another gasped slightly, but beyond that, there was no physical or emotional discomfort for much of their ascent. Most were perfectly content to climb the stairs once they'd passed that fifth step. In fact, as the D-Class personnel climbed up the stairs and underwent the accelerated aging process, none of them appeared to be outwardly distressed for the most part. They all remained remarkably calm and almost disinterested in the way their bodies transformed before their very eyes. Video footage showed the subject's skin rapidly aging, undergoing conventional wrinkling and deterioration. This one's pretty good. Diseases appeared to develop at an advanced rate too, as one subject's body, recovered by pulling them back down with the rope they were attached to, contained tumors around the prostate and above the eye that were not present prior Ooh. to the experiment. This subject was later discovered to have a family history of cancer. For all intents and purposes, it appears as if SCP-723 simply accelerates the natural aging process of the subject's body following the same DNA instructions and deterioration that you would otherwise observe over the course of decades. D723-7 was the subject to make it furthest up the staircase before the connection was lost. Approaching the fourth floor, the signal grew very weak, but in the noise could be heard a handful of distressed murmurings, including possible references to a door or the door, and to dark and mark. Beyond this point, there is no usable evidence. Local folklore in the area indicates that SCP-723 has been producing the same effect for generations. Stories can be heard from local residents about old church congregations who used to meet in the building and would mysteriously lose grandparents, children, priests, and strays who would disappear up the staircase. It is theorized that this is why the church building was left abandoned for so long. SCP-723 was only identified relatively recently, in the early 2000s, after reports surfaced of local children going missing in its vicinity. In response, the area has been cordoned off and designated as Site 288. A three-mile chain-link fence was erected around the churchyard with signage warning any visitors to steer well clear. A further two-mile restriction zone with magnetic locks is scheduled to be constructed in the near future. Three guards are stationed around SCP-723 oh, at all man. times of the day. None of them openly carry any weapons, so as not to arouse much attention from any passers-by, presenting the site as a mostly uninteresting, unsafe, derelict building. The guards are not permitted to approach or ascend the staircase, and the same goes for any SCP personnel. The only people permitted to enter SCP-723 are D-Class personnel, specifically approved by Foundation personnel with Level 4 clearance or higher. While little is known about the cause of the effect, or how SCP-723 physically works, one thing is certain. No person who has started to walk up those stairs has ever come back down again. Now go and watch another yeah, entry from the classified good. files of Dr. Bob, such as SCP-962, Tower of Babel, for another twisting structure of anomalous madness. And make that sure you subscribe good. and turn on notifications. I liked Aging Staircase.